How do you get good at reading? I'm open. Now, wait a second. We can't shout out here. So you Baptists will have to get a grip, all right? No <laughs> shouting out. Just play Catholic for the night. Raise your hand. I will call on you. Yes. What is your, what is your first name? Bruce. Bruce? You get better at reading by reading. reading. Bruce, 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 Bruce. That's like saying you get better at rollerblading by rollerblading. You do? How many people agree with Bruce you get better at reading by reading? And you're absolutely right. All the research overwhelmingly shows the students in all countries and in all languages who read the most read the best. That's reading fact of life number one, that it's an accrued skill. Strangely enough, the schools that have in the past been giving children time in which to read, the, um, the school term for it is SSR, sustained silent reading. Some places call it deer time, drop everything and read. There's deer time, dirt time, squirt time, but basically it comes down to 10, 15 minutes a day in which you would read just for pleasure. The kind of thing that you do when you have some spare minutes at lunch, breakfast, in a coffee shop, you're just having a sandwich. Rather than stare at the person who's sitting across from you, a complete stranger, and have them worry that maybe you're a stalker, you bring a newspaper in and you read. Well, w many places, not most, but many places give children time in school in which to read just for fun. A book, a magazine, a newspaper, and strangely enough, this is really bizarre, but Bruce, you can appreciate this, these students, the ones who have the most minutes per week of SSR, have the highest reading scores in the world. 32 nations study 210,000 kids, 9-year-olds and 13-year-olds, the ones with the most minutes per week of SSR had the highest reading scores. So Bruce has given us reading fact of life number one, that reading is an accrued skill. But many places are now eliminating the SSR, and they take that 15 minutes a day and devote it to how to take tests, special preparation classes for taking the state standardized test in reading. There is no research to show taking more tests makes you a better reader. The people who think that you can become a better reader by taking more tests, these are the same people who think that if you weigh the cattle more often, they will get fatter. No, folks, it doesn't work that way. Now, reading fact of life number one is tied to reading fact number two. That is, human beings are pleasure oriented. We will only willingly go back again and again and again to the restaurants with the food and the beverages we like. Driving to work or here this evening, if you had the radio on in your car, you listen to the stations with the talk or the music you like. Over the weekend, you visit the in-laws you like. And conversely, we avoid the in-laws, we avoid the music, and we avoid the foods we dislike. If a child finds more pleasure than pain in reading, they come back to it again and again and again, and like Bruce said, you get better and better and better at reading. But if you find more pain than pleasure, you withdraw. When you withdraw from reading, you're not reading much. If you don't read much, you never get much better at reading. You may end up running for governor or even president of the United States, but you don't get better at reading. So our very first challenge is to build as many pleasure bridges between a child and print as humanly possible. Now, how do we do that? 1985, U.S. Department of Education, a national commission was created by the way, this was under the Ronald Reagan administration. They studied the last 20 years of reading research. Their challenge was very simple. Find out what the heck works. Oh yeah, and, and while you're at it, see if you can find anything in the research that shows what doesn't work. They look at 10,000 major research projects, and at the end of two years of study, they issue a report called Becoming a Nation of Readers. 
and they were unable to find a single piece of research in the 10,000 that documented the idea the more worksheets a child does in class, the better reader the child becomes. No evidence to support it at all. What they found was this declaration. It's the very first declaration from the National Commission. The single most important activity for building the knowledge required for eventual success in reading is reading aloud to children. That's the most important thing. It's more important than whether the teacher has a master's or a doctorate, whether the principal has a doctorate. It's more important than homework. It's more important than anything else. That's the number one thing. So a parent says to me, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm supposed to read to the kid? I thought he was supposed to come home from school and read to me. How is he going to get better at reading if I'm doing the reading? Good question. Simple answer. Listening comprehension comes before reading comprehension. Think about it. If you've never heard the word enormous, you would never say the word enormous. If you never heard it, you never said it. It's a doggone foreign word. It's going to be very difficult when it's time to read it and write it. So just look at your favorite word. The word, sir, you're looking at me as though I just started to speak in tongues. Your favorite word, the word that you, you know your favorite word. You use it more than any other word. I, but I'm not talking about a love affair here. I'm talking about the number one word in the English language. That everyone in this room, excepting this young lady right here, but soon she'll be doing it too, uses more than any other word. The word is T H E. Do you remember the exact minute that you learned the meaning of the word the as a child? Not only do you not know the exact minute, but if Pretend for a minute that I'm a Russian exchange student. I've been living in your home now for two weeks. I'll also tell you there's no equivalent word in the Russian language for the, as we know it. They don't have a the. Lots of languages don't have articles like the. Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Persian, Farsi, Polish, Punjabi, no the. So I come to you on this um, Wednesday evening as the Russian exchange student, and I say to you, blue, is it Wednesday? Today's Wednesday, right? On these book tours, you have no idea what day it is, all right? But this is, this is Alabama, right? That's what I thought. Um, and, and I come to you as the, the Russian exchange student, and I say to you, I say, don't understand what you use over, over, over again. The, the, the. What, what means the word the? Okay, go for it. How would you explain the meaning of the word the? Are we in over our heads here tonight? <laughs> Is there a difference between a child saying, Ma, give me a cookie, or Ma, give me the cookie? Is there a difference? Yeah, see, the women get it. This guy, no clue. Absolutely. He just says to her, they got cookies here? I didn't know they had cookies. Where are the cookies? Honest to God, wherever I go, I always have to bring it down a notch to help the guys. I bring it down to what I call the Buttafuoco level, which is not as low as the Lewinsky level. We're just coming down one notch here. Gentlemen, is there a difference between a girlfriend and the girlfriend? Absolutely. All right, we're all on the same page now. The word the is not only the most frequently used word in the English language, but it's also one of our most complicated. It is so complicated that almost 100% of the librarians in this building, of the teachers in this community, and everyone here tonight would struggle to explain its meaning to a Russian immigrant, and yet it was our number one word walking into first grade. And we knew when to use it, where to use it, and how to use it. How did we learn it? By hearing it. We heard it three ways. One, we heard it over and over and over. Second, we heard it being used by superheroes, mom, dad, brother, sister, kids next door. And finally, third, you heard the word the in a meaningful context. That is the cookie, the nap, the crayon, and the potty. That's how you learn the language. You have to hear it before you speak it, before you read it and write it. So the whole time you're reading aloud to a child, you are feeding the listening vocabulary the child is going to have to have in order to have a speaking vocabulary, then a reading vocabulary, 
finally a writing vocabulary, but they all have as their original source the listening vocabulary. Let me give you something now that uh, amounts to a federal secret. It is a secret, although it's in public documents. It has been available in public documents since 1996. But two successive presidents and a long line of governors across this country have chosen not to talk about this research for fear that some of the people might be offended by the research. And if they're offended by the research, they might not vote for me. And yet this research clearly shows what parents do to hurt children and what parents do to help children. None of these parents are doing the stuff that hurts children consciously. They don't know they are hurting the child. So as long as they don't know this hurts, they're going to continue to hurt the child. So better they should hurt the child than I should lose a vote. That's the way the politician is thinking about this research. You make up your own mind. But I will tell you this, until we change the homes of America, you're not changing the school scores at all. They can test those kids till the cows come home and the scores aren't going to budge a significant iota. Because the child is only in school 900 hours a year and is in the home 7,800 hours a year. Now you want to hold teachers accountable. Well, which teacher should be held most accountable? The teacher who had them for 900 hours or the teacher who had them for 7,800 hours? That's the significance the parent plays in that educational process. So, it's the Johnson, Lyndon Johnson administration. They are forming the Head Start program nationally. They want the input from some social scientists. Among the people they approached were doctors Betty Hart and Todd Risley, the University of Kansas. They thought that Head Start was a terrific idea. When are you going to start? At what age? And the Head Start people in Washington said, oh, we're going to start at age four. And Hart and Risley said, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> You're going to wait till four? No, 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 you, you, are, you are way late. You see, the, the kids that we've got in the lab school, in the little preschool program that we've got here at the university, the lines are already drawn by the age of four. You have to start earlier. But they didn't have hardcore research to substantiate their claim. So Head Start went ahead, began at four. They've since dropped down to three. But as you'll see, that's late. What Hart and Risley began was a program that would eventually become, would be called Meaningful Differences in the Everyday Experience of Young American Children. What they did was to identify 42 families. And the 42 families were very normal, traditional families, no alcohol abusers, drug abusers, spouse abusers. Uh, there were some poverty families, there were working class families, and there were professional, high income, high education level parents. All levels were represented in the 42. All 42 families had one thing in common, a six month old child. The 42 families would allow a researcher to come into their home for one hour a month with a little tape recorder. And the researcher would simply turn the tape recorder on in the middle of the room and they would record for the next hour every word, every sentence said in front of the six month old child. They would do that month after month, year after year. In the end, they would have 1,300 hours of recordings. They would take every word off the tapes, match the words to the individual child who heard them, and enter them into a database. Was it a noun? Was it a verb? Was it an adjective? They counted the sentences and defined the sentences, and then the words as well. They had 23 million bytes of information in the computer. The first piece of good news that they had 
was that all 42 families, regardless of their education or income level, did and said the same things with their children. That surprises people. That's good news. You don't have to have a college diploma to be a good parent. And then the next piece of data that came out of the study was the shocker. Before I tell you these numbers, keep in mind, the single greatest predictor of school success is the size of the vocabulary of the incoming kindergarten child. For the simple reason that for the first four years of school, kindergarten through third grade, almost all the instruction is oral. So the child who comes to school with the most words in his head understands most of what the teacher is teaching and explaining, learns and gains. Whereas the child who comes to school with the fewest words in his head understands the least of what she's saying and teaching, struggles, falls behind. With that in mind, here's what they found. By the age of four, the professional child had heard a total of 45 million words. The working class child heard a little more than half of that, 26 million, and the poverty child heard only 13 million. There's a 32 million word gap at the start of school between the poverty child and the professional child, and what are the politicians and the, new, the newfound education experts saying in this country? If there's a gap between these kids and those kids, it's the fault of the classroom teacher. The gap was there before the kid ever stepped into the classroom. And you're expecting this teacher in 900 hours of kindergarten and another 900 hours of first grade to make up the gap that was caused by the parent not talking to that child, not engaging the child in conversation, and not reading to the child? And by the way, how are these kids down here going to catch the kids up on top? You can do it, but only if one of two things happen. If you get those rich parents to pull their kids out of school for four or five years, lock them in a trunk in the closet, don't take them on vacation, don't read to them, don't get them a library card, and maybe uh, the other kids will catch up and pass them. And the only other option is if that kid at the bottom, the at-risk child, becomes an insatiable reader so that he can find the words in books that are not being given to him by the parent who doesn't have the words. By the way, how do we cope with that? I did a parent program one night, and a father came up to me after everyone had left, and he said, I'm, I'm one of those parents in that poverty category. I dropped out of school. My wife dropped out of school. We've got a five-year-old. I want the best for my son, but I don't have the big words that those doctors and lawyers have. How can I give my kid words that I don't have? Isn't that a great question? And I said, fortunately for you, sir, there's a great response. There's a public agency in your community who comes to your rescue. And, and what they do with this agency is they take all of the nouns and all the verbs and adjectives that you would ever need in a lifetime, and they bundle them up, and they put them in little packages. And they loan these packages to you for three and four weeks at a time for free. It's called the Free Public Library, the People's Free University. At the beginning of the 1900s, there was a collection of immigrants who came to the United States who, among all the immigrants who were arriving uh, on the sh at, the, at the shores of America, one group, one specific group, discovered better than anyone the value of the public library and the library card. And they used the libraries more than any of the other ethnic groups. And it was the Jewish immigrants. And at the end of the 20th century, there was another similar group who discovered that all the jewels of America are buried on those shelves in that public library. And all you have to do is to take those two God-given shovels on either side of your nose called eyes and go in and start digging in those shelves and you'll dig up the jewels of America. And those are the Asian immigrants that have come in in the last 20 years. We need everybody in America to understand the great jewel 
heist that is available to us on, on those library shelves. Well, that's, that's basically the argument that I use in behalf of, uh, of reading and, and reading to kids. I want to open it up to some questions that you have. And if you don't ask me questions, I'm asking you questions. And we can get pretty personal here, so you, you're better off asking me questions. I'm open. Yes, right here. Oh, I thought you were sisters. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Fifteen days old, okay, all right, yeah. And so, um, actually it's never too late, by the way, to get him to get, they'll apply for that early acceptance, <laughs> all right? Because, you know, the University of Minnesota, you can never start too soon. There's a waiting list, okay, go ahead. So what we're doing is, we have little books even in the hospital that we're, we're reading to them, but um, is, is that a good idea even now, or just do you think at this little tiny age, uh, just speaking to them? All right, how soon do you begin? Um, certainly, you should talk to the child. Um, it, it, in fact, it's a good idea to talk to the child in utero. There is ample research, especially out of the University of North Carolina, to show that reading to a child in utero is effective. They took children uh, in the last trimester of pregnancy, and they were divided into three groups. So let's say it's one, two, and three. All right, so there'd be a group of children in this group, and then children in this group, and children in that. And their parents were given one paragraph of Dr. Seuss to read to the child every single day, in utero. After the children were born, they took a separate person that the children had never heard. That person read on tape the three Dr. Seuss paragraphs one after the other. The children were monitored, the vital signs of the children were monitored. And they had earphones on the children. And we're talking infants here, like a week old. The vital signs reflected immediately recognition of the paragraph for each child for the one that they heard in utero. So a certain amount of learning is taking place. So the sooner you start, the easier it's going to be. Um, and initially, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference, although children gravitate, as, as my eyes, as I, my eyes spread across this room, my eyes gravitate most quickly to the people who have patterns in their clothing. So that eliminates most of you. But the guy over here in the, uh, the check plaid and the stripes up there and the stripes right there and the patterns in that and this nondescript group over here, although you have, a, you have a nice little pattern over here, but those people with the patterns in their clothing, those patterns attract the eye. In the same way, the brain research at Yale University with very young children shows that their ears gravitate to rhyming words before they learn the other words. So Dr. Seuss and Mother Goose, I guess, knew what the heck they were doing with all of the rhyming. Uh, I, I will say this about um, reading to children af after they get to a certain age where they're able to grab and to chew and to roam. Don't expect them to pay attention for a long period of time. And second, they're going to want to hold the book. So how do you get around this at, that, at a particular stage? I found that reading to them while they're eating so they're in the high chair, they've got the food that they've, you know, they're, they're wiping through their hair and in their eyes and face, and you're spooning that, that um, uh, food into their mouth, and you've got the book out here. And you're talking about the book, and you're pointing to things, and before you know it, they understand that this is what it's all about. Reading and eating, that's basically what the world is all about. <laughs> Question, yes? Um, school principal, and one of the big debates in reading instruction over the last 10 years has been the, the whole language, phonics, balance, throw a big deal with the bath and water. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, the most comprehensive study ever done comparing the relative benefits of whole language instruction versus phonics instruction, the results were so clear cut that they put the results of the finding on the front page of the New York Times, 1998. I cannot remember 
another education research project, making it to the front page of the New York Times in the last 10 to 15 years. And basically what they said was the research showed clearly mixing both forms of instruction together works best. Not either or. Some children need a little more phonics instruction. Some kids need the whole language Im immersion where they're getting text in a meaningful context. But most of the time, blending it in together works the best. So, I mean, how this, this whole idea of phonics became a, a political issue is ridiculous. And a religious issue, that's even more bizarre. And, and I've gone through both the Old Testament and the New Testament trying to find any reference to phonics at all. The closest I came was the Phoenicians. That was the closest <laughs> I came. I mean, it is just so much silliness. Here, here's something that, that you, you need to, to know in order to put it into to some kind of, of context. To teach someone how to ride a bicycle is one thing. To make them want to ride a bicycle is another thing. If you only teach them how and they don't want to ride the bike, guess what? They're not going to ride the bike much. And if you don't ride the bike much, you really don't get terribly good at riding a bike. So you have to do both. And that whole language plays a large part in the motivation part, and the phonics plays a lot to do, has a lot to do with the, the mechanics, the instructions. You know, you know what brings people back to twins games, other than a wide streak of masochism? You know, you know, you know what brings them back to, to twins games, gopher games, uh, the, the, uh, the Vikings? You know what brings them back? They have favorite players, favorite teams, favorite coaches. You know what brings people back to libraries, bookstores? They've got Favorite authors, favorite kinds of books. Nobody has a favorite vowel. Nobody has a favorite uh, blend. No one has a favorite ending. Phonics can't motivate. They are mechanical. They teach you how to do something, but they don't motivate. You need to have the motivation, and that's where the whole language, that's where uh, literature in the classroom, literature in the home comes into play. And you know how hard it's going to be for Israel to win the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City? Do you have any idea how difficult that's going to be? You can bet the mortgage they will not win the Winter Olympics. They won't even come close. Is that because of the awful coaches? No. Does that have anything to do with having awful players, skiers and skaters? No. It has everything to do with the climate in Israel. Too much sand not enough snow. If Israel were located just north of Denmark and Sweden, we're talking a major hockey powerhouse here. Just as it's almost impossible to raise an Olympic skier and skater in Israel or Miami, it's very difficult to raise an Olympic reader in a home that doesn't have very much print, where they don't have books, magazines, and newspapers in the home, in the classroom, or in the school library. So if you really want to change that, that reading score, well, you're going to have to change the print climate that a lot of the lowest scoring kids are being raised in. And I don't see the federal government helping out on that or the state government helping out on that level at all. They just have high expectations. Test them more. You don't have to test anyone to find out who is failing reading? Every classroom teacher can tell you who in her class is failing by October. Not a big surprise there. We're going to spend $400 million on tests if the present administration has its way. And the tests will tell us clearly, you're going to fail, you're failing, you're failing, and you're failing. What we need is some financial help to help these kids over their failing. Uh oh, we don't have any money for that. We only have money for tests. There's no money allotted for remedial work to help these kids. This is like allotting money that gives everybody a test to find out if they have a particular disease. But we're not going to give any, put any money aside to cure that disease. We just want to know who has it. 
we'll let them die of it, but that's all right. Well, I mean, just as long as we know they have it. It's bizarre. It gets crazy. Question, yes? Across the world, the children who have access to the most print in the language that they're trying to learn have the highest scores in that language. But it certainly helps if someone reads that material to them, both in the initial language, their native language, and in the second language, so they understand, oh, what is in this book? But they have to have access to it. Um, Dr. Stephen Krashen at USC did a fascinating study with five adults for whom English was the second language. Uh, one of them, uh, four of the five were Asian. They were all women uh, in their 30s. One of them um, was Latino. They were all trying to learn English as their second language. They'd taken courses, but they struggled. It wasn't anything that they were doing naturally. And one of them, a Korean woman, had actually taught English in Korea in high school, but still found it difficult to read something like Time Magazine without getting a headache. So he and a graduate student at USC came up with this idea. They would get some teenage romance novels, the Sweet Valley High novels, for these women. Too hard. They dropped it down to the Sweet Valley kids level, which would be about on the reading level of fourth and fifth graders. They loved them. This was the best stuff they ever read in English. The woman who had taught English on the high school level became a devotee. She read almost 30 of these things. She fell in love with the characters. Well, this falls right into place with that idea of being immersed in the print. You have to have a lot of it and be surrounded by it and to, to do the reading a lot to get a lot better in that language. The research that we've done with graduate students. Now, grad students, that's the major leagues of reading. You, you can't get any higher than grad school. So that's like the Yankees. The twins would be like the minor leagues, and then you have the, <laughs> then you have the Yankees, grad school. They surveyed for 30, almost 30 years, the grad students, what are your fondest memories of reading when you were a child? What were the books that you loved? What were the books you hated? And there was almost unanimity on their, in their responses. The books they hated, now keep in mind, these are grad students. These are not truck drivers. These aren't retail clerks working at the local department store. These are the people who, who were so good at reading, they made it to the major leagues. Guess what they hated the most? The assigned texts in junior and senior high. The classics they were forced to dissect week after week after week for nine months a year. And then there were two kinds of favorite books. And they turned out to be two kinds you can almost never find in schools and almost never find in many libraries with the exception of ones like this. I checked outside. They have them. Comic books and series books. Nancy Drew, Hardy Boys, Cherry Ames, Trixie Belden, The Babysitter Club, Goosebumps, and now the immortal Harry Potter. You get better at reading by reading, and it doesn't make an iota's difference what they are reading. They get better and better and better by reading more and more and more. Immerse them in print, and comic books count. A um, couple of weeks, John Updike is coming. Um, Tim, what, what's, is Tim here? Uh, he's he's going to be in the pen pals. What, what, when, uh, what month are we talking? Uh, October. Okay, in October. As he was applying to Harvard as a high school student, the walls of his bedroom were decorated with the cartoons that he had clipped out of the magazines that his family subscribed to. He was crazy about the comics and cartoons. Last year, Ray Bradbury was here. 
had the biggest comic book collection on Flash Gordon in his neighborhood. I had the biggest collection in my neighborhood. Bishop Desmond Tutu had the biggest comic book collection in his neighborhood. And I got so good at reading comics that I eventually graduated from comics to sports books. And then from sports books to Sports Illustrated, before there was a swimsuit issue. <laughs> and then from there to my local newspaper, and then from newspapers to harder books, and, and, and I haven't read Sports Illustrated in a long time, but you know, hopefully it's a graduation process. Uh, if you've got a teenager who was hooked on magazines, oh, I, and I get this all the time. Oh, my kid, he hates to read. We did all the right things. We read to him. We had library cards. We bought him books. And he just hates to read. I said, well, what are his interests? Oh, sports. I said, all right, what about Sports Illustrated? Oh, reads it cover to cover. <laughs> I thought you told me he hates to read. And Sports Illustrated counts? Yeah, Sports Illustrated counts. Uh, quick story. Now, let me get another question over here, and then I'll come back to I want you to remind me, the home run book, all right? Yes. Teacher, how can we get that enthusiasm back to our students to get them involved with reading? All right, we'll tie it right into this question right here, all right? You can turn to the number one reading teacher in America today. And the question, by the way, is how do we get our teenagers into reading? Um, the number one reading teacher in America today was described by a professor at Stanford, the Harvard of the West, as the one person who has done more to positively affect the reading habits of the English-speaking world than anyone since Samuel Johnson. And I'm referring to Oprah Winfrey. Oprah Winfrey has put almost 50 books on the New York Times bestseller list, and not one of them was a Harlequin romance, not one of them was about thin thighs. There were Nobel laureates, there were National Book Award winners, but there was no fluff. How does she do it? Well, first of all, Oprah is a reader. She has been a reader and an avid reader since the age of five. She reads these books. This presents a serious problem for many parents and many teachers in America who know how to read but choose not to read. If you choose not to read, and please don't tell me you don't have time, because that's the biggest myth of all, no time. Are you kidding? If, there, if the people in America didn't have time to do something like read, all the malls, Southdale, Northdale, Chippendale, Clydesdale, all of these malls that you've got out here, they'd be all boarded up. All those video stores, they'd be abandoned. All those cable channels, they're out of business. Nobody has time to pleasure themselves anymore. We've never had so much time as we have now. Oprah reads the book. Incidentally, it's, it's a, the research substantially shows that half the teachers in America are illiterate. They know how to read, but they don't choose to read. I'm not, I don't believe that that's any different today than it was in the past. Um, today's teachers, well, 52% uh, of today's teachers have a master's or a doctorate. 40 years ago, what was that figure? 26%. So today's faculty is almost twice as educated as yesterday's faculty. But you still have half the faculty who don't read. That means they can't be Oprah. You see, I don't have a cold today. Bruce, you and I could share the same cup, the same pencil, the same cell phone, and you couldn't catch a cold from me today because I don't have it. If the teacher or the parent doesn't have the love of reading, they can't give it to the kid or the class. So Oprah reads the book, the walks out onto the national stage, and what does she do with the book? Does she make a little diorama? How about a little puppet show where the characters <laughs> talk to each other? She talks about the book passionately. Well, teachers, how many teachers here? Raise your hands. Teachers, you know, you've got a right to her. 
maybe if you did it collectively, you wrote to her and you explained to her, stop talking about the book. You've got to write about the book. You have to do some kind of an exercise. You have to answer 15 questions. We've lost sight of the fact in our schools that we're an oral species. We define ourselves first and foremost orally. You go to a good movie, you go to a good concert, you see a good play, you read a good book. What do you want to do? Take some stationery, write down the main idea? No. You want to call up your best friend and tell him you got to see this movie. It's terrific. Or don't waste your time. You, I mean, Pearl Harbor never ends. It goes on and on for like 12 hours. <laughs> Oprah. We can learn from Oprah. Um, we can learn from Harry Potter. Think about this. At a time when the educators and the experts were, pro and by the way, this includes a lot of publishers in New York, were proclaiming that thick books are dead. Children have no attention span anymore. They don't read anymore. They won't read a book. So don't bring a book into this publishing house that's 150 or, or 200 pages long because we can't sell them. The kids will not read books that are that thick. So you get those goosebumps. You can learn from those goosebumps. You only have eight words in a sentence. You've got Hallmark cards that have more words in a sentence than the goosebumps, right? So don't give us the thick books at a time when all of that's going on, and we've got the internet that Al Gore invented, and we have you know, 60 cable channels and televisions in 50% of the kids' bedrooms. Along comes Harry Potter, and kids are reading 400 to 700 page books that are unassigned. What can we learn from that? Well, what is, what's in the Harry Potter books that makes them so attractive? Gee, I don't know. They're, they just have a plot <laughs> and something happens so that you turn the page to find out what happens next. Well, they're not like those Newbery Award winners. Something actually happens in the book in each chapter, so you're turning pages. It's, it's make-believe, it's not real stuff. You don't become emotionally involved with Harry Potter. It's kind of the relationship that adults have with the books they take to the beach or on vacation. Page turners, they're turning. What do we give kids to read in middle school and high school? They ain't page turners, folks. <laughs> Anybody assign John Grisham to the ninth graders? No way. No, you do. God bless you and your work. Of course, you can go the other extreme. And, and maybe this, I'd like to see somebody try this. You want them all to read To Kill a Mockingbird. Fine. The principal gets on the public address system first day of school. Ah, I have your attention. I just want everyone to understand that anyone found reading this book, To Kill a Mockingbird, this book will be confiscated and will be brought to the office. No one is to bring this book onto the school grounds. Every kid in the school is going to be reading To Kill a Mockingbird. They're going to be highlighting, they're going to be undering, underlining, they're going to be saying, what do you think, this is the dirty part? No, 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 this part, this is the part over here. They'll be doing comparative literature. Forbidden fruit is always, so when all of these people got all upset about the Harry Potter books, my goodness, one, we should have been thanking God for Harry Potter. Think, think about this. If, if you believe that, as I do, that God answers prayers, think about the prayers that we have been sieging the gates of heaven with for 30 years. I'm talking parents, teachers, librarians. Lord, Lord! Deliver our children from the malls of America and bring them back to libraries. <laughs> Lord, disconnect them from Nintendo, Game Boy, their cell phones and pagers and bring them back to books. Thick books, not those skinny little goosebump books, but big thick books, Lord. And after 30 years, God answers the prayers and sends us Harry Potters. That's the answer to our prayers. He's got the kids reading again, and maybe best of all, he's got the boys reading again if they ever read in the past, I don't know. I was in Chicago a couple of years ago with my three, three of my four brothers. We're watching batting practice and some home runs were hit and then the subject of home run books came up and 
my brother Brian says, well, what do you mean by a home run book? And I said, well, Clifton Fadiman, back in 19, the 1940s, was a, one of the shining lights of American uh, culture. He said that um, people who were lifetime readers had books in their childhood, special books, certain books, that were like your first home run, your first big kiss. All other kisses were compared against that first biggie. All home runs compared against that first home run. He said for him at age four, it was the overall boys, uh, a formula fiction series. And so my brother Brian said to me, well, what was your home run book when you were a kid? And I said, well, mine was fourth grade, Call of the Wild. He said, I had two. I said, I know. He said, what? It was almost 40 years ago. How could you know my two home run books? I said, I'll bet you a dollar. He said, I'll bet you 20 to one you can't name the two books. I said, all right, you whisper the two books to Dennis, because I knew if that I named the two books, then he would change the two titles, right? <laughs> so he whispered the two books to my other brother, and I named the two books. A Distant Trumpet by Paul Horgan, and Gerald Green's The Last Angry Man. He said, how could you have known that? I said, because one, I read them first. I was two years older than you. We slept in the same room. As teenagers, we didn't talk a lot, but I tossed them onto your bed and I said, these are great books. And I noticed that as you read them and read them avidly, and prior to this, Brian had never read anything basically other than sport, sports magazines and sports novels. After that, his whole concept of reading changed. Today, and by the way, this was a guy who was a remedial student through the first five years of school, who was a CD student in junior and senior high, but today has a master's degree, is a millionaire, and a voracious reader. The point here is that Oprah has shown us the door and the window is never closed and bolted. We can create lifetime readers, but we have to do it with other people coming into their lives and enlightening them. In a sense, you have to keep pitching the books and hopefully the right pitch, the right book will come to the right reader, batter, in the right inning, and they can hit their home run. Uh, research that Steve Krashen did at two junior highs in California when he heard me tell this anecdote, and he got a graduate student slave to go and to do the research, and, and what they found was that the kids who were the avid readers, who had the high reading grades, they could all name a home run book already in their lives. The kids who were struggling with reading or failing in reading, not one of them could name a home run book. They had no book that had come into their lives that they could say, I love that book. So the more we play Oprah and the better we create the print environment in their lives, there was no shortage of printed material in our, ho in our, in our house. Um, the mailman once told my father, your wife gets more damn magazines than anybody on my route. She, if I die on the route, it's your <laughs> wife's fault. Question. Oh, here, that's right. Yes, right here. Um, yeah, I was wondering if you could talk about the relationship between the reader and the listener, um, and if you have any thoughts about books on tape and audio books. By the way, I love your Texas accent. It's, abs it's absolutely wonderful. I am a uh, huge fan of books on tape. Um, and in fact, I, I, uh, I listen to them a lot when I'm traveling. I've also found them to be very, very conducive when I'm trying to get to sleep at night. I happen to have one of these minds that it's difficult to turn it off. I tend to replay the day or to plan tomorrow when I should be sleeping. And this doesn't aid a good night's sleep. I find that if I can just get myself to stop thinking about myself, to think about something else, I relax and fall asleep. And so I've got one of these little pillow speakers, and it plugs into the tape, and I put it under the pillow so it doesn't keep my wife awake, and I listen to the tape, the story, for about five minutes, and I'm gone for the whole night. 
Of course, you wake up in the morning and say, now, where the hell did I leave off? What? I mean, you've got to play the whole tape back again and start over again. But I'm a big fan of, of, of books on tape. And I've learned so much from listening to the best readers on tape, on the, the, the pacing that they have. Uh, I found that there's one great company in the United States for books on tape, and that's the company Recorded Books. Uh, some of the other companies, I think they hire either their relatives or their mistresses to do the readings because you do have to wonder, how, why in the world would you pay somebody to read as badly as this? But Recorded Books, absolutely fabulous. Her name was Sonia Carson. She, was one, she herself was one of 23 children. Can you imagine the sock problem in that house? <laughs> Sonia Carson had only a third grade education. As a young adult, she could barely read or write. Now she was a single parent trying to raise two sons alone in one of the most dangerous places in America, inner city, Detroit. She had one son in junior high on a slow boat to nowhere, and she had another son in fifth grade. And the fifth grade teacher has just told her he's the worst. He's the worst reader, he's the worst math student, and he's among the most violent children in the school. Sonia Carson went home that day. She buried her head in her hands, and she wondered, what more can I do? All oh, I can barely read or write, and all the teachers can do is tell me I got to do more, I got to do more. What more can I do? And the more she thought about it, the more little things she thought she might be able to do that might help. First thing she did was to cross the room and turn the doggone thing off. Do we all know what the doggone thing was? If our viewers on Channel 35 will not be offended, she turned her television set off, but not completely. She limited her two sons to three hours of television a week. Now you talk about child abuse. When they got home from school that day, she said, you don't have library cards, do you? Well, you're getting them. You're going to the library right now. You're each getting a library card. You're going to take out two books because I said you are. That's why. And you're going to take out two books and you're going to read two books. You're going to read two books a week. And to make sure you read those books, you're going to give me written book reports on everything that you read. Now, you notice that she didn't take a vote on that because it, she, was, she was raising a family. She wasn't a, running a democracy. She didn't tell them for another 20 years that all the book reports they wrote every week she had never been able to read. She also turned to the youngest one, Benny, the fifth grader, and she said, your, your teacher told me today you don't know your, li your, your times tables. You're in fifth grade, and you don't know your times tables. Child, I only went to third grade, and I know mine all the way up to the twelves. And he tries to give it the old nonchalant. He goes, Mama, you ever see how many there are? <laughs> Take me a whole year to learn them all the way up to the twelves. And she said, well, I'm sorry to hear that, son. Now, he come right over here with me to the window. You see your friends out there? Yeah. Say goodbye to them, baby. Because <laughs> you're not going to see them for a whole year if that's how long it takes you. Guess what? Ben Carson learned his time staples, and he learned them fast, and the math scores went up. And because he was reading two books a week, Bruce, what did you tell us? The more you read, the better you get at it. Then the reading scores went up. And when the reading went up, the science went up, social studies went up. So by the time Ben Carson was a senior in high school, he was third in his senior class with full scholarship offers to Yale, Stanford, and West Point. He chose Yale, four years at Yale, then on to the University of Michigan for graduate school, and then down to Baltimore, where he lives and works today at the age of 52. His older brother is an engineer today. And Ben Carson is Dr. Ben Carson, the number one, number one pediatric brain surgeon in the world today. When he was 32, he was the youngest head of neurosurgery in the history 
of Johns Hopkins. Mrs. Carson played hardball with her children. No matter how good the school was, if they didn't get the support of the 7,800 hours in the home, the 900 hours in school wasn't going to be enough for the at-risk kids in his case. And, you know, coming back to the books on tape, in a, in a worst case scenario, if the parent didn't speak English or couldn't read English or was an illiterate because of learning disabilities, they could still listen to books on tape with the child, the family, and discuss the book. If you set that time aside every single night, it's a cultural experience. You're transmitting to that child a very powerful value message. We think this book, we think this reading is so important. We're not watching TV right now. We're not at the mall. We're not fixing the car. We're not mowing the lawn. We're not on the phone. We're listening to this book. We're reading. And if we had more parents doing that kind of thing in the homes, teachers' jobs would be, well, you could work half days and accomplish everything you're accomplishing today. It's interesting. There's a difference between a child's reading level and their listening level. Connor is entering first grade, not quite reading yet, right on the, on the brink. Elizabeth is in the middle of the Gary Paulson, Francis Tuckett series, which is written for fifth and sixth graders, and she's in the middle of reading that to Connor, and he is hanging on every word. He can hear stories that are on that level, but he can't read them yet. Hearing them, he understands that this is what reading is all about. And all that a, e, a, u, a, a, that, you know, this, all the phonics in class, if you think that this is the purpose of reading, you're in trouble. But if you realize that Gary Paulson and Hatchet, Francis Tuckett, that's the purpose of all the sounding out then you have a valid reason for continuing with all of the sounding out. All right, I'll, uh, I'll sit someplace and thank you.